I can say I'm I'm buzzing off of a uh, victory last night in my indoor beginners rec soccer league. Ooh, mm-hmm. congratulations! Exciting. I emphasize beginners because. Not to be falsely modest, because uh, people are encouraged to report players who are too good to <laughs> above the beginners <laughs> level. To, so there's a, a very uh, strict enforcement of the beginners policy, and I've not been flagged once. <laughs> so, <laughs> so is it is it like a you're trying to get people to inform on their neighbors? Is this like a Stasi situation? Very much so. I, I have a network of informants across the other teams <laughs> across the league. I like to envision this as an adult version of my favorite activity to watch on weekends here in DC, which is uh, toddler soccer, uh, which involves a bunch of three-year-olds with their arms perfectly vertical at their sides, held out flat, even when running full speed and running and just flailing at a ball that none of them land on, just legs akimbo until one of them takes a hit to the shins and then inevitably falls over. Uh, maybe slightly more stylish than that, but that, in that's, my dream that's scenario. That's what it's like in Tyler's like. League, too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, this, you're not supposed to do that? or. <laughs> I will say the last team sport I participated in uh, was in DC. And this is like more than a decade ago now, sadly. I was in DC. I was in a bocce league. And our team name, <laughs> which I will claim, was Patanka Donk, which I thought was a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good team name. And I was no, quite proud of at the good. time. I thought that was pretty good. I'm pretty Can we be the Patanka still. Donk edition? <laughs> the Patanka Donk edition. Maybe, actually. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rational Security. I am one of your regular co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson, bereft of one of my regular co-hosts who is dealing with a personal matter, but thrilled to be back here in the virtual studio with the other of my regular co-hosts, Quinta Jurassic. Quinta, thank you for joining me today. A distant third. Good to be here. <laughs> well, it's mixed. it builds up the drama of the introduction. That's the reason I sequence it this way. Who could it possibly be, this third person? But you are not even the last person I will mention. Instead, we have two wonderful guests joining us once again. We have Lawfare Managing Editor Tyler McBrien. Tyler, thank you for coming on the podcast. Always a pleasure. And our contributing editor and frequent guest, Eric Charmella. Eric, great to have you back on. Great to be with you. And we are really excited to be able to talk through several news items, one of which is ruining traffic throughout our native city this week, not affecting you so much, Tyler, but probably a big contributing reason why Quinta, Eric, and I are recording remotely, at least me. <laughs> I'm I'm here. Er- Eric and I are downtown. Yeah, speak yeah, for yourself. I'm not even going to try. Nice try. <laughs> I'm, it's I'm actually smart. totally fine where we are, I'm sorry to say. No, really? On the problems up, are, right. are closer downtown. Truly, I think I think Think Tank Alley will be devastated that that's the case, but that's that's okay. They like to think that they're at the heart of it all. Um, but we will get into the heart of it all, uh, among other big national security news topics this week, and what we are calling the Patank Adunk edition of national security. For our first topic, Ukraine in the membrane. NATO is hosting its 75th anniversary summit here in Washington, D.C. this week, shutting down traffic left and right. But its members' eyes are uniformly locked on Ukraine, whose eventual membership several will voice support for this week, even as others worry about what a future Trump administration might mean for the alliance and its commitment to the ongoing conflict there. What trajectory is NATO headed on, and what should the alliance be doing to prepare? Topic 2. So gauche. Left political movements emerged victorious over populist right-wing movements in two major elections in Europe this past week. In France, the left-wing new popular front squeaked out a narrow plurality over President Emmanuel Macron's centrist coalition and the right-wing national rally, while in the UK, a resurgent labor movement finally ended 14 years of increasingly unpopular conservative control. What do these results tell us about political trends in Europe, and can they shed any light on what the United States might experience in its own election later this year? And topic three, hindsight is 2025. This week, former President Donald Trump tried to distance himself from Project 2025, denying any awareness of the Heritage Foundation-led project that has produced a 900-page book of policy proposals for the potentially returning conservative president. Even though several of his former advisors contributed to the project and a number of its proposals seem to be included in the platform that the Republican Party adopted earlier this week. How does this agenda compare to what the Trump administration pursued in its first term, and what role is it likely to play if Trump does return to the White House? For our first topic, Quinta, let me hand it over to you to get us started. The NATO summit is very much, I think, taking place sort of in the shadow of the the coming election uh, in the U.S. in November. And I believe uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky actually said as much. Um, of course, President Biden gave remarks at the summit uh, sort of 
in a moment where there is a lot of concern among the Democratic Party um, on the Hill and elsewhere about his ability to continue campaigning and win a second term. Trump, meanwhile, has, I think, walked this back somewhat recently, but has been quite consistent um, about his desire to damage the alliance in some way or another, um, possibly by drawing the United States out of it entirely. Um, so I, there, there are some tensions happening right now in, in downtown DC. Um, there are also tensions around whether or not Ukraine will at some point be able to join the alliance. Um, so Eric, I wonder if I can turn it to you sort of first for your general read on what the vibe is. And then later, I also want to talk specifically about Ukraine. Yeah, so the vibe is definitely uh, one of great concern about the future of the alliance. Like you said, our domestic political situation is, you know, it's obviously nowhere on the alliance's formal agenda, but it's top of mind for every NATO leader coming to Washington at this time in the wake of the debate. Uh, and with the very realistic possibility that Trump will return to the White House. During his first term, you know, Trump had a really difficult relationship with most NATO allies. He sort of took the longstanding view of other American presidents that everyone needed to sort of pay their fair share. This was codified under President Obama um, at the Wales Summit in 2014, where there was a pledge by all allies to spend 2% of their GDP on defense. Uh, but Trump took that to the extreme and started, you know, badgering allies and threatening that they would be kicked out or evicted. He liked to compare NATO to an apartment building and he was the landlord and he needed to get rent payments. Otherwise, he would, um, you know, put these bad allies on notice and kick them out. And obviously, most allies did not react well to that kind of uh, haranguing. There's a lot of domestic political reasons as to why increasing defense spending is tough, um, you know, at a moment when economies are not doing well and social spending is really an important priority and so on and so forth. So uh, in any case, you know, the allies were really worried that um, Trump is going to come back and kind of use these unorthodox means of diplomatic coercion, not necessarily to get allies to spend more on their defense, that's okay, but to sort of put pressure on the fundamentals of the alliance. And it's sort of part of this whole conversation about, you know, what's more important or pressing of a national security threat? Is it Russian aggression in Europe or is it China? And, you know, the Trump sort of team's focus on China, an idea that Europe can sort of handle its own security, it can deal with Russia, doesn't need the United States, and we need to be totally focused on the Asia Pacific, has a lot of allies nervous. So that's sort of, you know, the, the backdrop of all of this. A lot of concern, like you said, about what's going to happen in our race. Is Biden going to stay in? Um, is there a Democrat that has a chance of beating Trump? What do we what do we Europeans do to kind of prepare ourselves? And then there is this question also about Ukraine. Maybe we can dig in a bit more about that, because, um, again, Ukraine's not a member of the alliance, but it is the most pressing issue for the alliance right now. Two quick follow ups to your question, Quinta, about the shadow of 2024. I think it's really telling that the coverage that I've heard so far of Biden's speech has focused first, sort of the lead has been the style or the delivery. You know, it's like, was it a vigorous speech? The the Times, I think, had the funniest example of this where they said, you know, it's something along the lines of, in a speaking in a strong voice and without making many errors, comma, President Biden. <laughs> Not bad. Um, but and then also the other thing is, is I'm, I'm interested what other people think of Eric, you brought up this uh, commitment of, you know, 2% spending, which Biden trumpeted in his speech as as a sort of a signature accomplishment of his, his administration, when I think it, elsewhere, it's been portrayed as not so much a Biden accomplishment, but uh, more of a a reaction or a Trump proofing measure. Uh, I think also the coverage uh, that I've seen so far of the summit has just been riddled with this term Trump proofing. And so I think that that very much speaks to, as you were, your question, Quinta, of the, the shadow of 2024. Yeah, I mean, again, the, the 2% question, it's been a longstanding one. And, um, you know, Biden can claim credit just as Trump can claim credit for some allies who uh, started spending more. But really what has kind of totally changed alliance dynamics and thinking is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So most allies that weren't spending above the 2% mark 
started to increase their defense budgets rapidly uh, after February 2022. And so that's really, it's just the changing geopolitical circumstances. But, you know, this whole idea of Trump proofing, I mean, you know, again, I, I sort of understand it, but there's there's really no way to Trump proof. That's, that's basically America proofing an American security guarantee to Europe. And it really makes no sense. I mean, I do think there are things that European countries can do to show that they're you know, pulling their weight. But even when they do, the message sort of either doesn't get through, um, through, you know, lack of information on Trump's part or willful ignorance. I mean, he was just truth socialing the other day that, um, you know, European allies weren't paying enough on Ukraine and needed to pay another $100 billion to match what the United States has spent. And actually, the Europeans have committed more than we have at this point. Uh, so, you know, I think they're in some way damned if they do, damned if they don't. And it's just, it's going to be a very contentious transatlantic relationship regardless. But there, you know, I do think there has been a, an increasing awareness on the part of Europeans that they have their own reasons kind of in a way separate from NATO itself to begin to build up their indigenous military capability in a way that does dovetail with the Trump demands and with longstanding U.S. grievances about NATO and the, the allocation of responsibility there, I think, um, for the simple reason that they need to be able to present a credible counterbalance even when American policy is mercurial. Um, and whether it's calls from, you know, the Macron government for more uh, European centri- central kind of military force or even intervention potentially in Ukraine. Uh, I don't think he got much people behind him on that one, either in France or other places at the moment. Um, but nonetheless, a much more willingness to lean forward and an ability to actually be a major, major military power freestanding of the United States, I think is an idea that has developed its own kind of cachet in Europe in a really meaningful way. And Maybe Trump deserves a little bit of credit for it, but kind of in the inadvertent way. It's not because Trump is like strengthening the alliance. It's because people aren't sure that the alliance is that stable because Trump is a realistic, reflects a realistic political movement in the United States. Um, And so the NATO alliance recognizing its limits means that Europe has to be ready to stand a little more strongly on its own, I think. Um, I do think Europeans are becoming more aware of that. The harder sell is selling it to its domestic populations that are going to take on the budgetary and taxation consequences and other consequences of that. Yeah, totally agree. So let's maybe talk about Ukraine. Um, As I mentioned, President Zelensky, of course, is here at the summit, although Ukraine is not yet a NATO member. There have been a lot of discussions about whether or not Ukraine could at some point enter into the alliance. And of course, the US and Ukraine have recently made a bilateral security commitment. Um, And we've talked before about that and sort of the question of how, how strong it is. So Eric, I'm curious if there are any tea leaves that we can read here um, in the dynamics at the summit about where that that might be headed. Yeah, so there's really, you know, kind of two um, related conversations here. The one about membership and the, and the sort of bridge to membership, quote unquote, that administration officials have been calling this, the sort of likely communique language and package of measures that are designed to show that Ukraine is on this irreversible course towards eventual NATO membership, even if a commitment can't be made right now. And then the second, and I would actually argue more important part, is the concrete commitments uh, of new defense support that allies are individually providing to Ukraine, and then the measures that the alliance at 32 are deciding in terms of future coordination of allied support. And those are, in my view, just much more uh, again, kind of concrete things that Ukraine actually needs um, to defend its skies in particular. I mean, there's a lot of focus on air defense, particularly after the, the really atrocious Russian attacks on Monday, including one that destroyed the main children's hospital and children's cancer ward in central Kiev, um, which is just really awful. So allies are ponying up additional air defense assets, and those should you know be arriving in Ukraine within the next few months and hopefully give Ukrainian cities a little bit better coverage. People are talking, you know, this week about um, the electricity grid in Ukraine, which Russia has just systematically destroyed over the past six months. And the fact that, you know, Ukraine doesn't really have a clear path to reconstituting its power generation capabilities before the winter. So there's really a lot of work that has to be done on this concrete sort of real commitments um, and deliveries that need to be made to to get Ukraine um, through the end of the year. But, you know, back to the membership question, I mean, it is kind of 
you know, there's a long history about this issue dating back to 2008 and the Bucharest summit where Ukraine and Georgia were first sort of told that they would eventually become members of NATO. That was a sort of compromise formulation that at the time, you know, President Bush and German Chancellor Angela Merkel agreed to, which was kind of, it was not an invitation, but it was sort of a declaratory policy that Ukraine and Georgia belong in the alliance with no clear pathway about how to get there. And Ukraine has just been, uh, understandably, particularly since 2014 and the seizure of Crimea, just been knocking at the door. Like, when when are we going to get this invitation? The issue is that right now, you know, there's a full scale war uh, with nuclear armed Russia, and it's impossible to imagine how the United States can extend a security guarantee to a country at war that doesn't have defensible borders. And so, you know, we've seen this kind of debate about NATO membership you know, divide allies, you know, the Poles, the Baltic states, you know, some of the Nordics, the Brits kind of think that an invitation at this point, you know, it's not a conveyor belt. And it's a, it's a strong enough political signal that needs to be sent to Putin now that, you know, his, his plan to uh, resubordinate Ukraine uh, has totally failed. And Ukraine will definitely be in NATO one day, even if we can't solve it now. And on the other side of the fence, there are those who say, definitely don't issue an invitation. And beyond that, you know, Ukraine should probably never become a member of NATO, period. And you saw that reflected in the letter that was signed by 60 or so American academics, um, including some of my colleagues at Carnegie, not myself, um, that Ukraine, uh, you know, should never be a member of NATO because it's not in the American security interest uh, to provide a, a guarantee. So again, you know, the, the issue is going to be sidestepped this week. There's not going to be any resolution, even if the communique has slightly stronger language. Fundamentally, there's an impasse here and there's no way to see beyond it while the war is raging. Just a, a quick follow up on the, the first of the two related conversations that you were mentioning, Eric, on the, the assistance piece. At the risk of dipping too much into the next topic, I was reading a bit about the incoming foreign and defense secretaries in the UK labor government. And uh, because I think there's this um, stereotype or, or idea or history of social democrats you know, across Europe de-emphasizing military spending, defense spending in favor of social spending. But I think anyone hoping for greater commitments to Ukraine would be heartened by the incoming foreign and defense secretaries because they've both been vocal supporters of support to Ukraine. And, and I was interested in reading that John Healy, the defense secretary, his first trip uh, outside of the UK, within 48 hours of being appointed, was to Ukraine, uh, which I think you know is probably seen as a positive sign uh, to Ukrainians and 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 their supporters. And I think that's a, a kind of notable, like broader trend we're seeing in Europe generally. Like you've seen the left, which I think historically has been for more domestic policy reasons, painting with a very broad brush, but like more willing to lean into the American security umbrella to be able to shift emphasis towards things like you know, a welfare state and various other benefits that Europeans enjoy uh, and are fairly popular in a lot of European countries. Now we've seen the left in large part because of the war in Ukraine become much more willing to engage and to prioritize military spending, military engagement. I mean, Olaf Schultz in Germany being you know, a leading example of this, right? Like little, a little uncertainty early on, uh, as you know, he came into office uh, right relatively shortly before the Ukraine conflict bro broke out, um, but has been a pretty strong booster and leaning forward in a lot of ways. Some limitations, some reservations, but nonetheless pushing both Germany to kind of re-engage in a level that in a ways that we haven't seen Germany do before in Europe more broadly, Emmanuel Macron, not a person on the left, but a, a centrist person that uh, has elements of the left platform that he's kind of borrowed and co-opted into his kind of centrist coalition, similar sort of vein, again, like a very lean forward guy to the extent he stays in power in France much longer uh, in a meaningful way. You know, going back to the enlargement question, I I do feel like this is a a debate that has gotten kind of quite stale around this sort of question because it is all about people debating eventualities for a future circumstance that we don't have any awareness of right now. And it's part of the reason I, I find it somewhat frustrating that we keep seeing these letters come up saying that we should rule out these sorts of outcomes in the future in one way or the other. Um, like, I do not think it would be wise for NATO to commit to uh, hard to Ukraine being in 
invited into NATO in the future for a variety of reasons, among other reasons that, you're, frankly, Ukraine has a lot of domestic reforms it needs to pursue, a lot of open political questions that you would want to be resolved before you invite them into a consensus-based, uni- unanimity-based alliance. You know, we look at certain other members of the NATO alliance and how troublesome they've been, like Turkey, because their commitments to democratic norms and other sort of values are very different from other members. That could be the case with the future Ukraine, which has wrestled with those issues in other contexts. I hope it isn't, but it certainly could be. But also shutting the door now just seems very premature on a lot of different fronts because we don't know exactly what sort of commitment or is going to be needed to support Ukraine. Obviously, NATO members are very willing to make a major investment in Ukrainian independence and political freedom and defense and security, even if they're not willing to go to war for it. And the deterrent effect of an alliance could be a major toolkit of that, a way to do that, frankly, somewhat more affordably, more more cheaply. And just because a country is not willing to jump in and go to war for Ukraine now doesn't mean that they may not be willing to commit to do so in a future scenario. So in my mind, I, I think, you know, I, I might not lean quite as far forward as certain NATO members are in terms of saying that Ukraine is clearly going to be a NATO member one day, um, because I think there are still big questions there as to whether it makes sense for NATO, as to whether Ukraine can kind of meet, meet the reasonable preconditions that should come with that sort of status. But keeping an avenue open, keeping discussions open, and finding ways to build up security cooperation that parallel NATO as an interim measure strikes me as very commonsensical. And you know, using this broader debate over eventual membership as a way to kind of dig at that argument strikes me as more as an attention grab than anything else that I, I don't think is particularly productive. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And you mentioned the kind of interim structures and all of that. You know, Quintet mentioned also the U.S. Ukraine security agreement that we've talked about on the podcast. And National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan did announce uh, yesterday that the countries that have signed bilateral security agreements with Ukraine, which I believe are 21 now, because Luxembourg just signed one a few hours ago, will be signing a document called the Ukraine Compact at the end of the summit, probably tomorrow that will sort of knit together these bilateral commitments under one sort of multilateral structure. Again, not not creating a new alliance, not institutionalizing it or creating some sort of permanent secretariat or anything like that, but at least creating this kind of framework political umbrella uh, so that, you know, these agreements, which are quite substantial um, when you really read through them and you look at the kind of different commitments in different fields of security, Uh, so that they have a little bit more coherence and a bit more of a governance framework. So I would say we're kind of, you know, this week is is moving the ball forward a little bit, inch by inch on these interim arrangements. And again, I think working with what we have now and focusing on kind of concrete support and really helping Ukraine get through what's going to be a very difficult next six to nine months, I think it should be more of the focus rather than debating you know, like Scott was saying, these future hypothetical scenarios that no one can envision right now and just sort of grabbing attention uh, because you want your name in the news. Well, speaking of Europe, it has been a very eventful week in European politics. Uh, And on one front, at least, a fairly unexpected week. A few weeks ago on the podcast, we talked about a pretty daring move that French President Emmanuel Macron uh, made following a uh, victorious surge by right elements of uh, French politics, particularly around uh, political movements associated with the national rally movement. These were kind of the European Parliament counterparts of that, so not a direct one-to-one, but nonetheless kind of similar political mechanism machine and, and ideology emerging very victorious in European parliament elections, and Emmanuel Macron responding by essentially calling for snap parliamentary elections at the national level in an apparent bid to kind of cut them off the pass. Uh, And that appears to have kind of worked, maybe, uh, although maybe the outcome is maybe even worse, (laughs) uh, depending on your perspective, uh, as to to an outright victory one side or the other, in that we saw the uh, national rally actually come in third in the parliamentary elections that Macron called a few weeks ago. Um, Second came in Macron's own faction, and third is the National New Popular Front, um, the kind of left-wing coalition uh, of parties in the French government. So we now have this kind of cleanly split three different ways, much like the French flag, parliament in France, where none of them have a clear mandate for establishing a government. Uh, And so we're going to have to see some of that coalition shuffling that we see in a lot of European parliamentary systems, figure out who is actually going to come out on top. I think right now they're maintaining the current prime minister, as I recall, 
but uh, I don't think they've reached a permanent resolution. I think that's understood to be an interim or temporary measure. Meanwhile, in the UK, we saw the end of 14 years of Conservative Party rule that, of course, included Brexit, among other controversial items. That came to an end in a pretty, actually, overwhelming electoral victory by the Labour movement and the Liberal, with help from the Liberal Democrats, who now have a new prime minister and are in control of government for the first time in, you know, well over a decade. That's a pretty notable development, um, given how dominant the Conservative Party has been, and particularly that kind of Brexit populist thread and the role it played in uh, kind of bringing the Conservative Party to and solidifying its control. Uh, Eric, let me start with you, because I know you are, are, are probably number one Europe watcher here. What do you think is really significant about these elections? How big? I, I don't think the UK one was a surprise for people who would watch the polling the last few weeks. The French one is, actually, like in part because polling was close. I don't think people saw this sort of rallying come, come about. Do you think there are takeaways here? Does this tell us something about the trajectory of, you know, right wing movements and responses to them uh, on the continent and in, in, in the UK and not on the continent? Um, or is that going too far? Are these really more kind of outliers that we shouldn't draw any broader conclusions from? I mean, I think the kind of broad takeaways are, number one, that there is a huge anti-incumbent sort of movement. You know, in the UK, like you said, it was against the conservatives who have been in power for 14 years. That was just a tidal wave. Um, and in France, you know, uh, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with Macron. And even though his party ultimately did not do as poorly as expected, this was, you know, this did backfire. Um, this ended up being a disaster for him, and it was not the result that he had hoped for. On the other hand, you know, I think the French election in particular, but also the UK election, um, where you had Nigel Farage uh, running this new party, um, it does sort of show that European voters are still not comfortable with the idea of these, you know, extreme, particularly extreme right political movements gaining power. And so, you know, in France, you really did see this interesting um, strategic voting uh, where you had candidates, you know, from the left or from the center, if they were in third place, um, you know, in this three-way race, they would, they would pull out their candidacy and sort of back the second place you know, person in order to try and beat the the national rally, the far right uh, candidate. And it seems to have worked um, probably better than they expected between the first and second rounds. So again, you know, French voters at least um, were not willing to put Marine Le Pen's party in power. And I think that's, you know, it's somewhat reassuring. But again, you know, looking at our own election and the, the cards that are stacked against, um, you know, our incumbent, I'm not quite sure that, you know, we can, there was, there was a way in, in 2016, uh, you know, when there was the Brexit referendum in June and people sort of saw that as a canary in the coal mine for our election. You know, I don't really know that you can take any solace from the UK and French election and port that into our system and say, well, you know, Biden's got it in hand. Yeah, I think there's, there's some significant differences between all three, right? So I think that the, you know, you can certainly put France and the UK together in terms of like anti incumbent. But I don't think it's a clean story about, you know, a coalition coming together to be back the far right, in part because the conservatives in the UK um, have really been struggling internally about whether they're a far right party or something more genteel. There's a great article by Sam Knight in The New Yorker, which I think one of us mentioned on Object Lessons a while ago that refers to the Tories as like far too genteel to have anything so grubby as an ideology. And I do think that one of the things that you really see in the exit polling and polling of people who voted for the Tories versus people who voted for reform, which is Nigel Farage's party, is that there's a real defined split between Tory voters and reform voters. And reform voters are much more in line with the kind of like global far right, Marine Le Pen, Trump bloc. Um, in terms of what they're looking for. So I would say I, from my perspective, at least, I read the UK results as the Tories have been in power for 14 plus years. They've systematically dismantled the country's governing institutions, uh, just in terms, not in terms of democracy, but just, just in terms of like, the ability of the government to function and do things. And people are sick of that, which is especially interesting, because uh I believe I'm correct in saying that uh, Labour, or at least the Prime Minister Keir Starmer, is not like he Starmer is not particularly popular. I don't think anybody really likes him. It's just that they really, really, really hated the Tories. Um, so I think that's that's important to keep in mind when we look at France. I think there's a story here that is worth 
paying attention to, which is the formation of, so it's not the national popular front, it's the new popular front. And it's the new popular front because it's a reference to the original popular front, uh, which was a, a left block um, in pre-war France that was formed to block fascists from getting into power. And of course, they did okay, and then very badly. Um, so <laughs> it's, you know, the idea of a popular front is kind of a, a rallying cry on the left. But I actually think that if you look at the new popular front in France, they did really well, in part because they were willing to actually link hands across the center and the far left, including like Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's on the, the far left, has, you know, has some pretty objectionable views, I would say, about, for example, Jews. But there is a, a real willingness to kind of link hands and work together to stop National Rally from getting into power, including by, you know, this sort of strategic dropping out of candidates. So if there was a, an instance where it seemed like a block of votes will go to National Rally if votes were split between a range of different other candidates, there was a sort of coordination on who would drop out, including uh, with uh, uh, Macron's party as well. Um, and so I think that there there is a genuinely encouraging story here about the ability of a kind of a broad center-left anti-fascist coalition to actually succeed in blocking a far-right movement from power. I, I will say for me, what that's made me think about is, you know, can we think about, I think that in the US it's different because obviously party structures are different. It's not a parliament that makes a lot of difference. I've, I have been wondering if you can kind of consider the Democrats as a popular front of a sort um, and what that might illuminate about both the difficulties in holding the party together and in drawing in center-right voters that the Democratic Party needs to push back against uh, increasingly fascistic, I will say, far right. And also, you know, what that means in terms of thinking about the dynamics of the U.S. election. Um, I mean, the other thing that I think is worth pointing to is that the two-round system that France had played a huge role here because that that is what allowed for this kind of regrouping. Um, after a national rally did very well in the first round and allowed the left to kind of say like, okay, like we, we really need to get our stuff together here. I will say I did see one suggestion that um, the fact that the timing was so short to the first round and then between the first and second rounds because of the way Macron called it uh, was actually hugely advantageous because uh, the left loves to argue and it meant that the left didn't have enough time to argue <laughs> over all of the things that inevitably would have broken up the new popular front before the second round. So you're saying it was a master Wonderful gambit by uh, President Macron. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, I also want to put on the table just quickly uh, for the UK, at least. I think there is a you know a theme or a common thread of anti-incumbentism, but in the UK, at least, just seemed extremely, extremely justified. I mean, to the points that Quinta mentioned, but also the clown show of. Tory leaders that, I mean, just regularly grab headlines here in the US because of how bonkers some of the scandals are. I mean, I think I don't need to go into Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and, and Rishi Sunak because they're they're well-known figures here in the US. But I constantly refer back to this uh, New York Review of Books article by Gary Young, who talks, uh, it's called Small Island from a few months ago. There's this one part where uh, he also mentions that Conservatives have lost eight of the nine seats in Parliament they were defending the past two years, but it's the manner in which they were lost that is just uh, mind-blowing. So to give a quick rundown, one MP resigned after he was twice found watching pornography on his phone in the House of Commons. One was sentenced to 18 months after being found guilty of sexually assaulting a minor. Another was accused of sexually harassing three women and using cocaine. Another admitted to groping two men while he was drunk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet another was found to have harassed and bullied a staff member and exposed his genitals near their face. And while these are you know, apparently unrelated, they certainly don't paint a picture of or lend much confidence to, you know, who's who's at the wheel in the conservative party. Um, so I just wanted to throw that on the table as well, because these are also things that voters think about in addition to inflation and, and such. Yeah, I would also say, you know, it was it was key that labor had credible leadership this time, because if you look at the last election in 2019, when Jeremy Corbyn was the head of the party, you know, Labour probably should have trounced the Tories at that point, but uh, UK voters were not willing to put Jeremy Corbyn in charge of the country. And so Keir Starmer, he may not be popular. He's seen as kind of boring, 
but boring and normal. And that was really all that voters wanted. Two very underappreciated virtues yeah. for both politicians and podcasts. So <laughs> exactly. Right. But it just goes to show, you know, the importance of not only having this coalition of, um, you know, uh, candidates with different ideologies that can come together and unite against the far right, but you really have to have a credible person at the top who can actually lead the country. And you're willing to say, okay, my vote here is going to put this person in charge. Again, in a parliamentary system like the UK, that's, you know, that matters more than in the French system where, you know, the government is going to be in some kind of cohabitation with Macron and he's going to be in power for another couple of years. You know, I, I, I want to come back to this idea about the lessons for the United States, which I agree. I think it's a little dangerous to draw too many parallels directly across the Atlantic. But I, I, I have to wonder whether there might be some something to draw away, maybe in the broader picture, if not directly for 2024. I guess two things that jump out at me, I'd be curious about your thoughts or if there's other things to jump out at you about it, is, is first, it's like both elections seem to be a pretty clear confirmation that the right, and particularly the kind of populist right, is not immune, even in the relative, relatively short to medium term, to incumbency challenges, to the anti-incumbent vote, which I think is is itself kind of interesting, because you are, there's this kind of assumption that the right is here as kind of a revolutionary movement, anti-status quo, and there's so much of the status quo to chip off against and chip out that like they have a lot of runway to be able to run for that sort of angle. But certainly in the UK, and I think potentially even in France, the arguments that like dismantling the state or taking steps that would seriously undermine delivery of services or things like that can come back to bite you or scare voters away before even putting you in office in a way that even people who might be willing to lean in as a protest vote uh, or maybe at the European Parliament level where there's much broader concerns about the status quo and there's much more a desire to kind of uproot an incumbency there becomes a much more challenging vote in a way because you are uh, – because people still value the ability of a kind of effective governments to some extent – and if your ideology is about undermining the ability to do that, that's going to come back and bite you. Again, it may not be right away, but it might be an electoral cycle or two or three down the road. I guess I just I just don't I don't think that that describes the Tories. I don't think like the Tories the Tories are a well since two thousand eight have been engaged in a systematic process of stripping the British government for parts as as an austerity measure. Like they're very locked into the, you know, sort of old school Washington consensus uh, to the point where the IMF essentially sent Liz Truss a letter saying, will you please cool it? But, you know, when you've lost the IMF. Uh, but so th they are certainly a they are a conservative party and they are a a party that was very committed to a sort of neoliberal economics that I think has fallen out of fashion broadly on both the left and the right. But I do not think in any sense they were a radical party. Farage represents a radical party. And I do think that the, you know, David Cameron's misread of his own party's dynamic and the dynamic in the country led to, a, you know, a victory for the sort of radical fringe in the form of Brexit. But I don't, I think that there's, it's important to distinguish between, you know, right parties that fail to provide services because they're so focused on austerity, which is what the British government has done, versus right parties that are offering a more populist vision, um, which often veers away from explicitly re rejects that sort of neoliberal economics. That was Trump's whole appeal in in 2016 is that he was saying, you know, NAFTA screwed you over and I'm I'm here to save you. I don't know where National Rally stands. My impression is that Farage is closer to Trump on that kind of populist economics. So I do think that, you know, there are multiple axes to this spectrum. And I, I actually wondered, looking at the results in the UK, whether it should be, actually be concerning in that Labour, of course, did extremely well, um, but there was a real surge for reform. And if you look at the vote share, because Britain uses a first past the post system, if you look at just the total vote share, reform did a lot better in terms of the percentage of the vote um, than it actually translated into seats. Now, maybe that is 
if you don't like reform, like that's good. That meant that Labour, the Lib Dems, Tories were actually very efficient in blocking out reform from getting seats. But I also think that that means that there is a, you know, that populist surge is still there. And the people who were voting for it were not voting, you know, voting the Tories out in rejecting it. They were seeking a right populist alternative to that kind of neoliberal conservative austerity structure of sort of party ideology, if that makes sense. I do think it's all wor- also worth mentioning, you know, again, these were two elections in major European countries, but there are also dynamics going on in other countries that, you know, should be of concern. You've got the alternative for Germany kind of surging ahead of the next German uh, federal elections that'll be next year. You've got Georgia Maloney in Italy, who's leading the most right wing Italian government since um, World War II. And although she has kind of actually proven adept at governing and has taken pretty mainstream foreign policy positions. Um, you know, she's still kind of moving the Italian political system rightward in a way that the country has not uh, experienced. And, and again, she seems to be being rewarded for that. So um, it's very hard to make these generalizations, um, you know, from, from just these two cases, um, again, when you look across all of Europe. Right. And also, you know, even just looking at the EU elections, right, like uh, Fidesz in Hungary did extremely poorly when it comes to, you know, voting in far right candidates in the EU bloc. So I think it's a complicated picture. Right. But then there's the anti-incumbency there cutting against it. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure I'm convinced that it's easy to group the UK or the, the Conservative Party and separate them so clearly from a kind of populist history that's played such a major role in their legacy. Uh, I mean, like Brexit is, uh, I feel like has been cited in numerous places as like one of the major outcomes and factors and in, in legacy of, of their 14 years of rule, which is obviously builds on very much a right wing kind of populist movement. Right. But Brexit was a mistake. Like Cameron but called for the vote because he thought that it would be rejected. But I mean, it's still like something that's been followed through on by conservative government and was a policy priority that they helped implement and support in part as a, you know, riding on the backs of a kind of populist right wing surge. I mean, I I don't know. I I don't disagree with what you're saying. Like there's different dynamics here. But I think that I'm not sure it's easy to divide so easily, you know, the right into these camps of like there's still the neoliberal and then there's the populist right, even in the Trump case, right? Because we did see Trump embrace all sorts of neoliberal, what might have been described as neoliberal policies, whether it's like massive tax cuts and other items that are very much part of its legacy, part of its platform still. Like it's the awkwardness of knitting those things together that, if anything, is that I think is like an indicator of a lot of right wing political coalitions now, not that they can fit very easily into one camp or the other. But there is this knitting together in like kind of a weird way that I do think there's some parallels there. Right. No, my, my point is that the Tories as a party are definitionally conservative. Like they are the original conservative party. They want to not change things. Um, there has been a right fringe of Brits who vote for the Tories, but who are ideologically more populist and who now are re- re- supporting reform in the form of Farage. So- the, obviously, both of these elections set these countries kind of, kind of a trajectory uh, with which they're going to read the tea leaves of saying, here's where our electoral future lies. And in the case of the UK, we're seeing a case where, again, we have a broad tent approach as at least a contributor to the political reality here, a kind of coalition uh, mentality. In France, we have a very kind of chaotic three-way split in parliament that we're still sorting out what exactly that's going to look like. Do you have a sense about where you think the trajectory might lead in one or both of those cases? Tyler, let me let me start with you. Well, I think it's interesting. I just get the general impression that uh, in the UK's case, uh, because of the capability of the labor leadership, it seems like a, a sort of a stable future, at least near future. Uh, where France, I've just seen a lot of question marks. If you see, if you read coverage of what happens next, it's it's usually several scenarios long. Um, one being uh, cohabitation, which is um, sort of a shared leadership between parties, between the the premiership and and the president. Uh, there's the possibility of a technocratic government of these unaffiliated bureaucrats, which strikes me as very, as very French. Um, you know, he, here in the U.S., we just man up and let our government shut down if we disagree. Um, but they, I guess, they appoint uh, technocrats. But uh, I, I think this is troubling for a lot of uh, French voters. I'm, this is uh, pure 
anecdotal evidence, but I was speaking with a, um, a French friend, a French journalist who has a, this sort of accelerationist fear that these results, while on, on its face uh, should be some people would celebrate for defeating this fascist or far right uprising, uh, could actually result in a completely ungovernable France for the next two years. And uh, when Le Pen does win, she would win and, and her party would win with a, you know, a much bigger mandate than they would have won uh, had they performed better in this election. So um, I am not sure. You know, I think I think the, the, the best coverage is just laying out a few scenarios because it's, it's hard to land on anyone with certainty. I do think that is the big concern. Tyler hit the nail on the head that if they can't come to some sort of reasonable agreement about, um, you know, a government that somehow represents the results of the election, and there's just sort of chaos and ungovernability for two years, then the chances of Le Pen winning in 27 and her party winning a really large parliamentary mandate, because presumably whoever wins the next presidential election will dissolve parliament again and call one uh, a new election right afterwards, um, that it would be a huge, you know, win there. And that was exactly what the wave that Macron was trying to stop. And it's just not clear whether he's managed to stop it. Well, it, do we have a sense about like how big and deep the divide is between the Macron camp and the New Popular Front camp? Uh, because, I mean, insofar as the New Popular Front is mobil mobilized as a kind of coalition effort to prevent the right from rising to power, Macron was mobilized into calling these elections by a desire to show the failure of the right. It certainly seems like there is a, a common interest, a common enemy between the two, uh, at least in terms of what's mobilizing their voter base. But is the divide too deep that we don't think they'd be willing to or able to reach a, that sort of coalition? Um, Eric, do you have a sense of that? Or either, any of you guys have a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty big tent in the left camp. You've got the old socialists, um, you know, the former president, Francois Hollande, you know, and then the Greens, the French Greens, and then you've got the communists and uh, Mélenchon's party, far left party. And so you could imagine kind of a splintering of the left camp with the more center left, you know, socialists and greens maybe going into government with the centrists and with the French Republican Party, which is their center right party of, you know, former President Sarkozy and Chirac. And so maybe that would kind of be a broad center right to center left kind of grand coalition, similar to what we've seen in, in Germany, you know, under Merkel. So that's a possibility. I don't, I can't see how, you know, Mélenchon and Macron's people could work together in government because Mélenchon's views are, are pretty far um, outside the mainstream, especially when it comes to foreign policy. But again, even in domestic policy, I mean, they're pretty, there's some pretty big differences and spectrum in the left camp itself. Yeah, I think um, early indications are not so hopeful. I was reading some reporting in Le Monde that quoted main leaders of the, the left, general left bloc as, as refusing any, quote, alliance of opposites or any, quote, arrangement. Macron himself, I believe, has not yet spoken uh, on the possibility of this sort of unity government or, or coalition government. But uh, the leader of the Renaissance Party, of, of his party, um, said that any any such coalition, um, they would come in with with significant preconditions. So I'm not sure that inspires a lot of confidence of, of nas a national unity government, but it's, I think, still early. Well, uh, from the resurgent right in Europe, across the pond, to the resurgent right here in our own backyard, we have the third topic, hindsight is 2025. Scott, I think you nailed these topic names Thank this you. week. Um, but only light assist from chat GPT this week, but, well, the lightest of assists. <laughs> oh no, how the sauce is technically made. original, if, if, if perhaps a little bit of AI inspiration. Well, the uh, topic is, is uh, Project 2025, which, uh, although it was originally published, I believe back in January by the conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation is back in the news very recently because uh, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump has uh, been making statements, sort of distancing himself from this 900-page tome of policy wish lists of, of Heritage Foundation think tankers. But I want to start with a, a bit of a scene setter, uh, and I and I would love to go to, to you, Quinta, on this of of what you know this document is and what what role think tanks play in uh, you know presidential transitions. Uh, you know, I think other countries that we were just talking about have shadow governments and, um, you know, how does this relate to sort of shadow government or, you know, administration in waiting? Um, or is it just a, you know, like a wish list from a, from a 
a think tank. I think there's a really important sort of broad story here about the role that think tanks play uh, more generally. Um, so I'm drawing in, in making this point on um, E.J. Fagan, who's a political scientist, and you had a really good Twitter thread about this. He also has a book out, which I have not read. Um, but essentially making the point that, you know, heritage has kind of positioned itself as a conservative advocacy think tank really since the 1970s and had at least in its own self-presentation, great success in kind of providing the Reagan administration with this playbook called Mandate for Leadership um, of sort of conservative policy wish list, essentially, along with a big list of staffers who could kind of go in and implement those policy priorities. Um, and in the sort of the story of heritage, uh, that move in 1980 was extremely effective. This isn't just a, you know, this isn't a vast right, right wing conspiracy thing. This happens on both the right and the left, but it's sort of part of that broader project. Um, I think what is notable about Project 2025 specifically, which is, you know, that the policy list is explicitly called mandate for leadership. So it's very much, you know, situated in that history is a couple things. One is just the sheer radicalism of the policies that are being advocated. Here, um, we've already spoken about Schedule F, um, which would uh, significantly undercut protections for civil servants and allow the president to sort of implement loyalists throughout the government. There are a lot of other proposals in there. One of them involves banning porn. Um, <laughs> Yep. Um, that's that's what is important here. Um, it is a 900 page document. So there's a lot going on. But it, the, so the radicalism of the document, and then also the extent to which I think heritage is really trying to write on a blank slate here. I think there's a sense that the first Trump administration was kind of hobbled by a lack of vision, a lack of a clear agenda, because Trump came in sort of unexpectedly. And there's an effort to kind of set this out and then, you know, provide people who can go in on the first day and really go ahead and implement. Um, and so this kind of falls into that broader structure. It is very funny how this document, which I think I've, you know, I've been looking at for a while now, I think it's it was it's publicly available, it's not a secret, um, kind of became a big issue uh, in the last, like, I don't know, month or so. Um, John Oliver did a segment about it focusing on Schedule F. I've seen some kind of hilarious polling that indicates that basically, if you tell people about Project 2025, they, they, they are not fans. <laughs> there, there is not a lot of support for it across the board. And the Democrats have really, really been hammering it, um, suggesting that the, you know, these, this is not a popular document. Um, and some of the sort of radicalism that's in it is not particularly popular either. The other point that I would make is that I think there's an extent to which heritage is now kind of bridling at uh, this portrayal of, you know, this shadowy organization putting forward this proposal behind the scenes. It's definitely true that you can make it sound more cloak and dagger than it actually is, but it is also true that, frankly, they have played into that. Um, I can't find the link now, but there's a bizarre clip of the president of Heritage on Steve Bannon's War Room podcast essentially saying, you know, this document will allow us to implement a new American revolution and it will be bloodless if the left allows it to be. Like once you start putting out language like that and kind of cackling and, you know, dancing around like a James Bond villain, people are going to find it weird. Well, but I think that like that mentality is so central to the entire mission of this document and so expressed like in its whole orientation, um, particularly if you read the forward and kind of like the orienting principles that it lays out at like great, great length. It's like a 20 word page forward um, that lays out all these sorts of ideas that a lot of which have roots in, you know, kind of vaguely Christian nationalist sort of ideas. Um, but foundationally, like, say essentially, the left is such an enemy and has so co-opted the operation of the government that no measure is untoward in opposing them and in undermining their efforts to engineer society using government tools, including using government tools to engineer society in a way that we prefer <laughs> and in a way that we think is contrary to what's been done before. It's this ultimate, I mean, it's, it's the ultimate trick of this sort of political era by folks in this kind of political band, which I don't think isn't fair to associate entirely with the right, but is a unique seg subset, but an increasingly important subset of the right that says essentially we have an enemy and that even kind of undemocratic means are acceptable um, to rival that enemy and to uproot and abolish them. 
I think, you know, I, I, I believe that heritage folks have already said like this line about a bloodless coup was a bit of a you know, rhetorical flourish. It wasn't serious. But something very close to it is actually very serious under here because it is saying essentially we're going to we are willing to do things and to just that are kind of beyond the democratic norm. And to justify being able to do that, we paint this very dire picture of the left, the kind of ambiguous, you know, ill-defined left that includes, you know, all civil servants or most civil servants, all sorts of academics, Hollywood, lots of other people, and just gloms them together saying, this is the enemy. They are actively conspiring against, against us and so we can conspire against them. That's the scariest part of this more than anything else in my mind. And it's really interesting in the way that you see that motivation in a lot of these proposals. And often, like, where it's even the bullet proposals, the actual proposals that come out are often like, kind of watered down. Whereas if you read the actual kind of prefatory text of the proposals, it says even wilder things about oh, what should happen, about agencies being abolished, things being torn down. And then they say, but, you know, that's probably not going to happen. So here are five proposals that are a little – still pretty – wild, but not that crazy. Um, but it, it's just such a strange tenor of a document. It's really uh, kind of upsetting to read, honestly, is, is, is my reaction. I would also say, you know, as I was kind of diving into a couple of these chapters, I mean, it really does kind of show a lack of understanding of how government works and what the actual problems are, because no one is going to argue that the government bureaucracy functions perfectly well. Um, there's certainly need for reforms uh, and and all of that. But, you know, as I was kind of reading through, for example, the, the chapter on the intelligence community, I mean, there's so much time spent about like the relationship between CIA and DNI and how the CIA needs to be subordinated to the DNI and so that the DNI can better direct resources for, you know, really key catastrophic risks like bioweapons. And I was just like, really? I mean, this is very strange to me. First of all, obviously, the CIA focuses on things like chemical and biological weapons, and there's a ton of expertise there. And secondly, how does putting the CIA subordinate to the DNI, you know, really solve kind of the, the bureaucratic challenges that do exist? And then permeating this whole, you know, this chapter and many of the others is this idea that these agencies are just filled with, woke, I'm using air quotes here, but, you know, woke leftist um, ideologues who are spending all of this taxpayer money on crazy, you know, initiatives to promote diversity, and they've totally gone soft and lost any connection with their core mission. And so most of it is just like an angry screed against this. And again, if we're talking about, you know, what agencies like the CIA can do better when it comes to intelligence connect collection and analysis, there's certainly critiques to be made and certainly improvements to be made. Um, but this doesn't come anywhere close to identifying what the problems are and proposing realistic solutions. I'm curious what people make of, you know, I guess the reason why we're talking about this again now, which is Trump at least rhetorically distancing himself or his, you know, his campaign distancing themselves from this document. Also, in light of the RNC actually releasing its platform, which was very brief, the people's sense of, you know, just how much overlap there is between Trump's platform, the RNC platform, and Project 2025, because my sense is there is a great deal. And I think uh, the Trump campaign is just reacting to polling, as, as you were hinting at, Quinta. But we should be as scared as we are are because there is such a great deal of overlap in in what the Trump campaign is says says it's going to do and and with project 2025 20, or am, is that a misread am, you know and have i not really read the, you know the fine print i think that the no i think that the dynamic here is important to put together as you say with the the sort of hollowing out of the rnc platform in the sense that what this indicates more broadly is the sort of extent to which the republican party institutionally has been subsumed by trump individually and what i mean by that is that you know there is not a platform outside of trump the platform i'm vastly oversimplifying here is you know Trump 2024, MAGA, <laughs> exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Um, and that there's this kind of uh, depending on heritage to provide the chops here, which maybe they're not even doing <laughs> to, to Eric's point. 
But I think, you know, if you read through some of the Project 2025 document, um, there are all of these indications that it's very much like crafted in line with sort of a specifically Trump focused agenda. Like, you know, the stuff about the deep state, their their section on the uh, FEC, which is by Hans von Stokowski at Heritage, is basically just like a, a five page rant about how Trump actually didn't commit any FEC violations with the Stormy Daniels payment. It doesn't really have very much about like what the agency should be doing. <laughs> and so I do think that there, there's a kind of story here to be told about the the hollowing out of parties, the extent to which think tanks can and can't fill that gap, and the extent to which Heritage in particular has positioned itself as sort of a, not just a Republican think tank, but a like a MAGA Trump think tank. And Project 2025 also is not just this document. It's also the collection of people who could go into the administration and this sort of LinkedIn style vetting of, I mean, this is the fundamental issue that I think the, the Trump people and, you know, the MAGA movement in general want to avoid if they win is they felt like, you know, Trump was totally unprepared when he won in 2016, he came in in 2017 with no team. Um, and that meant that a lot of, you know, career civil servants kind of kept their positions and served in acting capacities for a long time. And so the kind of political impetus from the Oval Office did not filter down to a lot of the departments and agencies, and it took them a long time to get their act together to just fill positions. And so they want to have this slate of people ready to go in. And, you know, this is maybe the scary part as you kind of read through it. And there's a lot of this bureaucratic kind of, uh, like I was saying, should the DNI be in charge? Should the CIA be independent? All this stuff where you read and your eyes kind of glaze over because it doesn't seem that interesting. But the point is, they are trying to build the case that there are people out there who understand the bureaucracy better this time. They're trying to get noticed by Trump so that they can get in the door and have this slate of people that the personnel office can install in all these different positions early on and then start implementing the political agenda, which is not totally spelled out clearly, maybe in some of the preambulatory language like Scott was saying, but it's, it's not entirely clear what these folks would do once they get in. I mean, certainly you can make implications based on a lot of the public statements, but it's not really it's not really laid out in sort of policy specificity in this document. You know, I kind of want to put out reasons why, while I think there are reasons to be concerned about this document, we shouldn't just take it on face value as like, here's a platform that's likely to say this is the direction we move in, even in a second Trump term. Um, the one is that like, this isn't the first one of these sorts of documents, either Heritage or other groups have put together. And Heritage, when it's ranked its its effectiveness of prior proposals like this, has usually said something like, oh, up to 50% of our proposals were implemented. Uh, and seeing that as a really positive score, right? Like, that's actually like really a big accomplishment. And I'm sure there's like a fair amount of puffery in there, uh, as that is the nature of, of self-promotion. So, you know, these things are inherently ambitious and overly ambitious. They often also serve, I think, as like tent widening devices in it, within an ideological faction in that it provides a lot of hooks for people who like certain things to glom onto and support one particular movement. That's actually like an express purpose of this document. They say they're trying to put together a big overarching strategy for the conservative movement. And that's why you see so many individual groups, many of which are like really, really niche in terms of what they actually care about having co-signed and signed on to this. But that means you're making a lot of promises to groups that in terms of like how likely it's a lot easier to put some of these proposals in a document like this than to say, we're going to make this a priority, take the political heat and actually implement it. And then you also just have the basic realities of governing, which is that like, Presidential administrations have very limited bandwidth, more so than I think people appreciate to proactively implement things. I think the Trump administration, the prior term, had a particularly limited bandwidth. And part of that was because of the people that are around Trump. But frankly, Trump had a very experienced, competent team that was there to advise him early on in his first term, many of whom he later removed. It, a lot of it just came down to the weird personality and idiosyncratic dynamics, I think, of the Trump White House that I'm not sure will necessarily change, even if it is a much more kind of like-minded set that comes in on day one. And so, you know, my suspicion is that you're going to have to do a lot of arbitrage, say which of these things are actually going to rise to the top to be a priority. And the administration is going to do it kind of sequentially and, 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 and carefully over time, because doing all these things at once is going to be a lot of political heat on them, because many of them are controversial. And 
they are particularly going to be doing a lot of other controversial things early if President Trump is elected, like ending the criminal investigations against him. So I think those things are much more likely to take priority and eat up a lot of the political capital in the early days of the administration, a lot of the focus. And other things like this may well happen. Like, I think they should be taken seriously, but are likely to kind of fall down the priority list, maybe be watered down, made things more politically palatable. So, you know, again, I think we have to see this as as an aspirational kind of like guidepost for a big segment of people that are going to have a lot of influence in the Trump administration. That's not the same as a copy and paste sort of document. And that's even setting aside the fact that I think a lot of stuff in here is not even legally viable. And would that's the advice that the Trump administration is going to get from lawyers when they actually talk to them about this. Um, and, and that's going to really enter into the calculus of what they actually implement, I suspect. But we will we'll have to wait and see. Well, folks, that is all the time we have together for this week, but this would not be Rational Security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder over in the week to come until we are back in your pod catchers. Quinta, what do you have to lighten the mood for us this week? Well, I think you setting, probably don't setting want, perhaps unrealistic expectations. I was going to say, I think you probably don't want me to talk about how Alice Monroe's stepdaughter published an article saying oh that God. Monroe had turned her back on her after the stepfather abused her. Talk about, <sighs> talk about regrettable object lessons. <laughs> I was I wasn't actually going to mention that, uh, but then you you set me up so well. No, um, I have been reading a novel. It is by James McBride called The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store, and I believe it won a bunch of awards, and everyone has probably read it already. But I would just like to say. It is excellent. I think the cover flap made it sound a lot like, you know, a a quirky, diverse community comes together against adversity, which is a kind of book that I usually hate. But it is not that. Um, It's a really sort of detailed, textured portrait of a mixed Black and Jewish and immigrant community in the 1920s and 30s in Pennsylvania, um, and a number of sort of terrible tragedies that occur and how people respond and is just really, I think I feel like I always say this, it's really well written. Um, McBride is an incredible writer. I think there's a lot here that reminded me of his last novel, uh, Deacon King Kong. He also wrote the incredible The Good Lord Bird, which is about uh, John Brown. Um, so highly recommend this if you have liked any of James McBride's other work or if you are looking for a, a yarn to distract you on these hot summer days. Well, for my object lesson uh, this week, uh, I thought I would flag uh, that you know we had a notable death, actually, I guess a little more than a week ago because I went on last week, and that's Robert Town, the screenwriter of the movie Chinatown, who died just days, I think, after the 50th anniversary of the release of the movie, if I'm recalling correctly. Chinatown is a phenomenal movie for those who haven't seen it. I think it's a very kind of prescient and still uh, kind of very relevant movie, despite being 50 years old. Uh, one of my favorite movies, not terribly original favorite movie, but probably my favorite movie uh, that I'll claim regardless. Um, and uh, it's really interesting movie to watch these days. And to, to testify to its relative relevance, there are actually two really excellent articles in The Atlantic talking about different aspects of its legacy and its relevance, both to kind of national politics in one case and towards Los Angeles in the other. I thought I would flag this. The one is the 1970s movie that explains 2020s America by Ronald Brownstein. Um, and the other is The Lies Los Angeles Was Built on, built Upon, excuse me, by Chris Stanton. Both really phenomenal, really interesting reads for a phenomenally interesting movie. And I'll just say, uh, this was all written actually just days before Town died, presumably, I think, in alignment with the 50th anniversary. Uh, but this coincided with news that the long debated David Fincher Netflix project, which was going to be a bunch of prequels to Chinatown, kind of fleshing out the history of the character the main character, uh, evidently is kind of on hold. Robert Town said he finished all the screenwriting, but uh, David Fincher wants to do something with uh, Squid Games, uh, I guess, before he can turn back to this. I don't know what exactly, which I find infuriating and like one of the most depressing stories about a stalled project I've ever seen. So hopefully, perhaps Mr. Town's uh, sad demise will drive Mr. Fincher to restore that project and start moving on it, uh, because that's something I would tune in to see. Taylor. Not Taylor. Tyler, <laughs> what do you have for us this week? Sorry. Uh, no, no problem. Um, I have something that uh, when I saw it on my timeline made me gasp, uh, which was um, the if you're familiar with the DC influencer named Tony P, um, he is a, a 25-year-old consultant. I think he has since left that job. Uh, a notorious bachelor, as he calls himself, uh, who is known for his radical earnestness and um, just very pleasant demeanor. He was uh, in a promotional video for NATO. Um, so uh, this shocked me so much, and I had so many questions. And sure enough, the Washingtonian delivered uh, with a with a short a short piece uh, as a short backstory of how this came to be. 
Uh, but the best part about this this little strange nugget of DC influencer lore is that apparently when NATO approached uh, Tony P's agent, Tony P's response was, quote, when my agent first said NATO, I thought it was Shark NATO. And I'll just leave it there. That would have been a segment title. God damn it. Where was that? <laughs> oh, saving Earlier the best today. for last. Oh. I will say I had no idea who this guy was till uh, somebody started talking about him on the office Slack the other day, and I googled him, and I he did not realize he called his brand vibrant masculinity, or at least that's what's described in like a GQ interview, which I distrust automatically. That does not sound great. I think it actually is more positive than I thought because it's kind of a response to the toxic masculinity. Online. Right? But yeah. maybe, There's maybe some just gender like, theory happening there. Yeah, and- but I still don't love the way. Really masculinity in general, maybe we can just let go. <laughs> That's yeah. like a, a theme that we want to evoke. Um, but seems like a perfectly nice young man. Uh, but I was I was struck by that. Yeah, I also had a, a similar aversion to, to that phrase. But if you, I, there's a great Washington, uh, Washington Post profile of him. He has quite a touching backstory and uh, this, you know, working class upbringing outside of Boston. And uh, once I learned more about him, I started to be, he found him more endearing. Sounds like somebody's angling for a guest appearance. Tony P, reach out to us. We'll put you in touch with Tyler M. You guys can hatch it out uh, on the next video. We'll co-post it here on Lawfare. Uh, Eric, what 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 influencer do you have to share with us today? <laughs> well, um, it, my influencer is uh, maybe a group of influencers, uh, hundreds if not thousands, uh, in one of our newest NATO allies, Finland. I don't know if listeners are aware of the Finnish hobby horse, um, national championships, and the national sport of hobby horse riding, which has become extremely popular. Um, hobby horses being, you know, the plush horse heads on a stick, which uh, young Finns ride around and do dressage and other equestrian, you know, jumps and whatnot on their hobby horses and take it very, very seriously. And it has become somewhat of a national pastime in Finland. Uh, so it's that is a fun way to spend your time if you'd like to go down some rabbit holes on YouTube and watch uh, a bunch of Finnish kids jumping around on horses on sticks. Is this because it gets really cold and dark there and they need something to do like in those, those cold <laughs> it, winter it, nights? It might, be, it might be. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. So I, I'm not sure. I don't actually know the origin of this. This seems to run counter to the <laughs> cultural obsession with saunas, which is my favorite Finnish uh, That's true. inclination. That's uh, true. To the point that evidently, like so Finnish soldiers, when they deployed to Afghanistan, already a fairly hot and dry places in parts of it, at least during much of the year, brought saunas with them into the field, uh, which is amazing. But I feel like they'd be a fire hazard between hobby houses, <laughs> hobby horses, and saunas. But maybe they fireproof <laughs> them somehow. That's hopefully, true. yeah. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. But Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to visit us at lawfaremedia.org for our show page, for links to past episodes, for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. While you're at it, be sure to follow us on Twitter at RATL Security and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. And sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. For more information, visit lawfaremedia.org slash support. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Pacha. On behalf of my co-hosts, Quinta, and our special guests, Tyler and Eric, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>